Welcome to week three. This is the video lecture for chapter three in your textbook, Cells Structure and Function. Your book focuses on these four driving questions here in this chapter, structural similarities and differences between the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, um, some cellular membrane stuff, antibiotics, and um, organelles. I am going to skim over membranes rather quickly so this one right here uh, i think your book does a really good job of explaining that quite simply um, as well as antibiotics your book talks ad nauseum about antibiotics i want to save our discussion um, about antibiotics specifically antibiotic resistance for our evolution discussion so i'm going to skim over this one um, for for now but make sure that you read and understand the textbook. Ask me any questions that you have from the book or from this video lecture. All right, cell theory. This is the theory that states, one, that all living things are made of cells, and two, that new cells come from pre-existing cells. And you should right away see some issues with this. I'll talk about them one at a time. This first part right here, all living things are made of cells. This excludes viruses, uh, which I like to talk about because they're my favorite. Um, it, it's not a big problem. You can just interpret that and uh, live your life through one of three explanations. First of all, you can take this to mean that viruses are not living things. I myself am not satisfied with that explanation, however. Uh, secondly, you can um, think of viruses as an interesting anomaly, um, an exception to this theory, something that just doesn't fit in. Or three, you can take the understanding that maybe cell theory isn't the best explanation for the unity of living things. With further research and discovery of more anomalies, such as viruses, maybe a better theory will be developed. We'll see. Um, but this second part right here, this is more troublesome. If all cells must come from a previous cell, then where did the first cell come from? That's an age-old question been asked by mankind for millennia. It is assumed that there is a last universal common ancestor known as LUCA. That's the acronym. The image that you see on your right here uh, is a recent reconstruction of the tree of life. The relationships that you see here were uh, determined by a genetic analysis of the ribosomal DNA from the cells of uh, different organisms within all three of the domains. The three domains that we have are bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. So we'll go through these. In blue, you see the many branches of the domain bacteria. These are by far the most biodiverse organisms on the planet. Uh, some of these probably sound familiar. You've probably heard of E. coli, probably heard of Salmonella, um, maybe you've heard of Chlamydia too. Uh, cyanobacteria way up here we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, these bacteria are thought to be the first life forms on Earth. In fact, Luca was a bacterium probably somewhere around in here. The um, branches that you see are all currently living organisms. Now, further down this tree, further away uh, genetically, which just means that um, the linear distance along these branches indicates uh, more differences in the genetic sequences of these organisms. So genetically distant from bacteria are in red are these things called archaea. Now, archaea are also prokaryotic, also unicellular, um, but they're actually more closely related to us, according to the ribosomes, than they are to bacteria. We ourselves are in the domain, domain eukarya, or eukaryotes, um, seen here in green. Eukaryotes can be unicellular, or of course, because we are multicellular, they can also be multicellular. These are the kingdoms that you're probably familiar with, like plants and animals, fungi, and protozoa is the other one. All right, so what this tells us is that we evolved from bacteria, even if that sounds far-fetched. Genetic analysis tells us that's what is the most likely explanation. But then where did bacteria come from? Where did cells come from? 
at some point there weren't cells anymore. There are several hypotheses about uh, the early origins of life, but my favorite is the RNA world hypothesis that I told you about uh, a couple of lectures ago. Um, what this tells us is that it's thought, this is all very hypothetical, it's thought that RNA uh, existed on Earth before cells and at some point developed the ability to self-replicate outside of cells, just pre-living RNA molecules dividing and making copies of themselves. At some point, they ended up surrounded by a membrane uh, and cells came from that. But the interesting thing is that some viruses have RNA instead of DNA. These are examples, if you think about it that way, of self-replicating RNA that is non-cellular. It's outside of a cell. There are also viruses that are quite large and contain almost all of the genes necessary to replicate themselves. An example of this would be something called a Mimi virus, so named because they almost mimic bacteria when you look at them under a microscope, they're that large. If you take these ideas just a step further uh, and consider the way that viruses infect host cells, uh, you can kind of come up with this idea that maybe through this infection of self-replicating RNA into a, a liposome, remember a, a cell membrane in a spherical shape, that perhaps the first cells came from or necessity required them to be infected by a virus in order to gain that hereditary molecule. Now, a lot of evidence would be needed to accept that hypothesis. It's pretty far-fetched, but the speculation is a lot of fun. For now, we do operate under cell theory. All living things are made of cells. We also know that all cells have certain traits in common, whether they're prokaryotic or eukaryotic. They all have all of these traits. Now, I've talked before about the cellular membrane. Uh, so let's look at what components make up that membrane. Here you see there are two layers. This is a lipid bilayer, two layers. Uh, you've got a zoom in here of a single one of those units, a phospholipid. Right here is what those are called. You also see these green proteins stuck in there. These are membrane proteins. Uh, those membrane proteins are important because they control the flow of substances both into as well as out of the cell, which makes this cell membrane semi-permeable. This doesn't show you, uh, but there are also carbohydrates stuck into the uh, lipid bilayer, the cell membrane, which um, they act as, you can think of them as kind of sugar tags, they're cell surface markers, which enable your immune system, uh, among other things, to tell the difference to differentiate between cells that are from your body and belong there and cells that don't belong there. Invaders, such as bacterial infections, um, they can tell viruses uh, from the lack of tags as well. The human blood type system, A, B, and O, are based on these sugar tags that are unique to people as individuals. And the cytoplasm, which all cells also have, is the stuff inside of this liposome. Uh, it's an aqueous solution, so it's mostly water. There are also some ions and some molecules, such as electrolytes and things floating around in there. Let's get rid of these drawings. Now, all cells also have DNA. Prokaryotic um, cells, so our bacteria and archaea, they house their genome, their uh, chromosomes, in a circular shape, like this red one that you see here. Uh, they also can have these smaller, also circular pieces of DNA, with just a couple of genes on them called plasmids, and they can share those um, between each other. It's kind of neat. Eukaryotes have linear chromosomes, like this blue one here. Um, I've also included RNA, um, which is, so DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, if you haven't heard that before. Um, and RNA is ribonucleic acid. So they're almost the same uh, molecule, except that RNA has an oxygen where DNA doesn't. It's deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, RNA, we'll talk about a lot more later in chapter eight, um, but what it does is it carries information from the DNA, from the chromosome into the rest of the cells. Specifically, uh, what we'll look at is to the ribosomes or protein synthesis. But 
uh, I want to talk a little bit about an exception to this rule. Uh, there are certain cells in multicellular organisms that don't have any DNA or RNA in them. So the uh, example that's commonly used is uh, red blood cells in humans and other animals. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They don't have any DNA at all. They don't have the ability to synthesize RNA. They don't have the ability to repair damage to themselves. Uh, so your blood cells, your red blood cells, wear out every 120 days or so. So your bone marrow has to continuously make more of them from stem cells in that bone marrow. You want to treat your bone marrow well and not irradiate it or anything too much. That's why you wear a, um, one of those vests when you get x-rays. That's part of the reason why. Also, all cells, also with the exception of red blood cells, have ribosomes. Ribosomes are these conglomerates. They're actually molecularly large, but compared to the rest of the cell, they're very tiny. Uh, they're made of protein and some ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. That's what makes up these large and small subunits. These are the site for uh, protein synthesis, but again, that's chapter 8, so we'll talk more about that later. Now, eukaryotic cells are a little bit different. They have all of those previous features. They also have membrane-bound organelles. This is their most defining feature that separates them from prokaryotic cells. Your book goes through each of the major membrane-bound organelles, but I want to talk about two uh, in particular that I think are the most interesting. These are the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. All right. Now, mitochondria, you've probably learned as uh, the powerhouse of the cell. This is a site for aerobic respiration, which we'll learn about next week in Chapter 6. Uh, but it is a process that gives you a whole bunch of uh, energy through um, processes that require oxygen. Now, mitochondria are kind of weird because they have their own DNA, which isn't normal. Most uh, organelles don't have their own DNA. They have their own ribosomes as well. This is different from the ribosomes that are covering um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. These ribosomes are separate from uh, the rest of the ribosomes in your cytoplasm. These are unique to the mitochondria. They also have this matrix, which is all this stuff inside of their inner membrane. Um, this is aqueous solution with some stuff in it. It's very similar to the cytoplasm. Speaking of membranes, they have two membranes, outer and inner membrane, which again is weird. Most organelles only have one membrane. This has two. Chloroplasts have some of these same features. They have this stuff called stroma, which is that aqueous solution inside, very, very similar to cytoplasm. They have their own DNA, also weird. The only other organelle is um, mitochondria that have that. They also have an internal and external membrane, inner and outer membrane. Two membranes. It's, it's just weird. They also have their own ribosomes. So both of these individual organelles have all the defining features of a cell in their own right. And that is very weird. Now, there's an explanation for this uh, that was introduced in the 1960s by um, a scientist named Lynn Margulis. She was uh, pretty widely criticized, considered a total quack, uh, until with the rise of molecular techniques and the ability to, uh, to sequence some of this DNA that's unique to mitochondria and chloroplasts, as well as advanced microscopy, the ability to look at these a little bit more closely, they finally accepted her ideas, and now they call it endosymbiotic theory. Your book talks about Lynn Margolis, Dr. Margolis, uh, in the little sub-chapter right after chapter three. It's called Milestones in Biology. This is the first one. They're really interesting. If you have a little bit of extra time, I don't know, put your textbook in your bathroom. That's how I get stuff read. So what she introduced, what she hypothesized um, was this event and this, the explanation for this event is what has turned into endosymbiotic theory, was that there was a larger 
cell. This is billions and billions of years ago before true eukaryotes arose. The way unicellular organisms get their energy is by eating smaller little bacteria and things. What they do is they form this little mouth shaped uh, thing in their lipid bilayer and this smaller cell is brought into it and then it gets closed off and now the smaller thing is inside. That's called endocytosis, which just means into the cell. What the cell would normally do, this larger cell, is then send out lysosomes full of digestive enzymes to break up and digest that smaller bacterium and get some energy from it. It's a meal. But for whatever reason, one of these brought in something similar to a mitochondria, free living bacterium uh, that was capable of aerobic respiration. And for some reason, instead of digesting it, uh, the two cells developed a symbiotic relationship, an endo symbiotic relationship because it's inside of the cell. This gives a very large benefit to the host cell because now they have the ability to harness all the energy being produced by what is now through this endosymbiotic relationship, an organelle. Uh, the organelle has the benefit because when it was a free living bacterium, it was at risk of being eaten. Uh, and so now it's got the safety of being inside of a larger cell, which is less likely to be eaten because it needs something bigger to eat it. Similar with the chloroplasts, same uh, explanation for how these got inside the cell. Now the host cell in this case would have been the ancestor of things like plants that photosynthesize because the chloroplast is a site of photosynthesis. These organelles take light energy uh, and use that energy to convert carbon dioxide gas into glucose molecules. That glucose can then be used to form cellular structures. It can be stored as carbohydrates such as starch or uh, lipids such as oils, like olive oil, um, or it can be used right away for more energy. So it's a similar thing. Lots of uh, benefits to the host cell because they have more uh, molecules of energy as well as structural molecules if they have a chloroplast. The chloroplast not being free living anymore is a lot safer, a lot more likely to be able to divide. Now these both divided uh, and do still in the host cell or just organelles that divide on their own in our cells now today. Kind of a, a weird thought at first. It took a lot of evidence to convince the scientific community that this is probably what happened. Now, uh, adding further um, support to the endosymbiotic theory was the discovery of Paracoccus denitrificans. This is what they call it free living mitochondria. It's a bacterium um, that is very similar both structurally as well as genetically to mitochondria. Despite the billions of years separating them, they haven't changed a whole lot. Kind of neat. Uh, we haven't found something that specific at the species level uh, to give us a proxy for a free living chloroplast. But what we do know about are these cyanobacteria, also bacteria, also photosynthesizing. They used to be called blue-green algae before we realized that they weren't algae at all. They're bacteria with um, you know, better microscopy. We realized this, but for some reason, the name stuck. So if you've heard blue-green algae, what it really is uh, is a cyan colored or a blue green bacteria, cyanobacteria. All right, maybe someday we'll find a free living chloroplast uh, within this cyanobacteria group. Who knows? All right, short and sweet. I'm hoping that this lecture gave you some insight into uh, the structural features that are common to all cells as well as those that are unique to eukaryotes, being those membrane bound organelles. We talked about cell theory, we talked about endosymbiotic theory, and basically just how weird life is, my favorite topic. For this week, you're also going to read chapter four, nutrition, metabolism, and enzymes. Uh, there will only be one quiz covering both this chapter, chapter three, and the next, chapter four. Uh, you do need to write separate annotated bibliography entries for each chapter, though. After this video, I suggest you go on and do that, do chapter four stuff, uh, watch the lecture 3.2, which is covering chapter four, 
I'll go ahead and post in the discussion and to the assignment. Have a good however long before you watch the next video.